Good morning, church. Great to be with you this morning. It's so incredible, uh, again, just to sing together on a Sunday morning, to be in the same room. I want to say hi to everybody who's watching online, on YouTube, Facebook, on our platform. Uh, we're so glad that we can still be together. Uh, I want to invite you, if you would, to turn to Genesis 28. Genesis 28. Uh, if you're brand new to the scriptures, you can pull out your phone even and type in G-E-N. -G Two eight, uh, or you can just follow along uh, as we go here. So Genesis 28, uh, ch verse 18. We're in a series, because um, we're in a season. We're in a series called Easter People. And uh, it comes from this line, Easter people living in a Good Friday world. It's this marker of who we are as followers of Jesus. We are resurrection people. We are in a season of Easter. Easter is not just one day on the calendar, but this six weeks, a number of Sundays that we come together and celebrate what God has done. So Genesis 28, verse 18. By the way, if you're brand new to the way of Jesus, brand new to church, you got dragged here, you stumbled across uh, the online feed. Uh, you are so welcome here. We call sanctuary sanctuary for a reason. We want it to be a safe place, a sacred place for you uh, to, to engage your own spiritual journey and make sense, along with the rest of us who've been walking with Jesus for a long time, uh, who this Jesus is and what he might have to say to us. Verse, we're actually going to start, not in verse, sorry, not in verse 18, verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of that place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching in heaven, sorry, reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families on there shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you. And will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate to heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning and he took the stone that he had put under his head and he set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. So let's pay attention to this here. He called the place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way, that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God and this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. Jacob sets up a stone pillar to commemorate what is in the Jewish world. And those of you who've been studying scriptures for a long time, following Jesus for a long time, you know this is a pivotal story, a marker, a pillar of the whole story of these Hebrew people. And he sets up a stone pillar to commemorate the moment, to mark this powerful interaction, commitment, and covenant that's happened in this place. Exodus 24. When Moses went and told the people uh, of all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice. So if you're unfamiliar with this story, Moses comes down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, which is sort of a marriage covenant. Here's how we're going to live together. God has rescued these Hebrew people from slavery. They've been saved by grace. And now here's how we're going to live together. And he says, everything the Lord has said we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Epic moment happens. Supernatural moment, just like Jacob. A covenant is made. And what do we do to mark this moment? We, we apparently, we... we we, uh, we build a stone monument. We build pillars. 
When God had freed, later on in the story, God had freed the nation of Israel from the bondage of slavery in Egypt, um, and the Israelites finally were about to enter the promised land uh, that he had given them, this eternal possession that God had them, uh, enter the promised land, that crossed the Jordan. He instructed Joshua to tell the priests to take the Ark of the Covenant, whole other story for some other time, and go before all the people crossing the Jordan River. When the priests who carry the Ark, they hoist it up on these long poles, put their feet into the water, they ended up standing on dry land. It was this miraculous moment of them being able to cross over. We read in Joshua 3, And it shall come about then that the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall resist Sorry, so rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, and the waters which are flowing down from above shall stand in one heap. It came about that when the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one from each tribe, and command them, saying, Take up for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you, and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. Fast forward a little bit to Joshua 4, uh, verse 6. Let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones, so these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. There's another story uh, in Joshua where he builds, uh, again, another stone pillar when the covenant was renewed at Shechem. These stones were called standing stones. Now, I'm sure at this point you are, are, especially if you're new to all of this, you're wondering where are we going and why are we talking about stones and ancient tribes and old miracles in the Old Testament? The standing stones, again, were this memorial Long before even the Israelites had entered the promised land, pagans in the Middle East, so other tribes in the Middle East, they would erect these sacred stones to honor their gods, to declare covenants and treaties between cities, to honor any important event that could only be explained by the supernatural. So although many standing stones were kind of simple and small, archaeologists have actually uncovered impressive, impressive stones um, that were probably put in place, like the one in this place called uh, Tel Gezar, that were put in place 3,000 BC that weigh tons and tons, standing 20 feet tall, some of them, sunk deep, like 20 feet deep, one of them, into the earth. So the Israelites followed this ancient custom by setting up standing stones as a reminder of God's promises and his supernatural acts on their behalf. Miraculous, transformative moments marked out in a land of traveling tribes, stones. The story then of these stones would be passed down from generation to generation. You would be walking by with your children and you would remember. And somebody, some elder in the tribe, would share the story. This is where God did this. Now, over the years, if you've been a part of Sanctuary, we've actually talked a lot about this, about the idea of the Ebenezer, about the importance of remembrance as a spiritual practice. Even just during this last year, during the pandemic, we've talked a lot about the power of that, this. This is not where I'm going today. The, uh, by the way, one last thing about these Hebrew, um, these standing stones. The Hebrew word translated li- it literally means to set up, to set up. You set up stones and you remember and you share your family stories. You set up stones to trigger the question, what happened here? What happened here? Now turn with me if you would to the New Testament. The beginning of the church. This is the beginning of the Easter people movement. First Peter chapter 2 verse 4. Peter writes to this new outpost of the kingdom, as you come to him, as you come to Jesus, the living stone, so let's stop. He calls Jesus the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, 
now referring to the rest of the, of the church, referring to people like us, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. A holy or a royal priesthood, he goes on to say. Peter uses stone imagery to say something about what the church, what the family of Jesus followers are to be like. And he calls us living stones. The church is not a building built by a stone, right? Built by stones, but a community of people and not just any community. It's one that comes to and comes from this living stone. In the Jewish consciousness, the stone, remember, is the marker of the supernatural. The marker of God's covenant promises fulfilled. So, of course, Jesus is like the capital L living stone. The ultimate stone. And we are to be like him. We are to be people. To just to be just to spell it out for us this morning. We're to be people that should trigger the question, what happened here? What, 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 what happened here? As people are passing by, like what, what happened here? As we embrace each other's stories, just being in the family of God, forget those outside the, 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 the family. As we look around today, Right, as you like note the names in the chat, people who are watching online. We look around and, and we ask, we're to ask like, okay, what, what, what happened here? Uh, my wife and I got to take a, a little trip uh, last week, two weeks ago, uh, visit a friend of ours who's putting on a conference uh, in, uh, in Nashville, which was such a fascinating experience for a different time to tell a story of like going from the Northeast to Nashville in the middle of a pandemic. It was, it was all sorts of fun stories. Um, but we had uh, this one evening where we decided, I don't know how many of you love getting on the scooters, the spin scooters or bird, or in, in Nashville, there was spin, bird, lime, all these big scooter companies, these electric scooters that you see around. And so they were everywhere. And um, I love going on these. My wife, not so much. Um, so I, I was like helping her like download the app and you, know, you can do it, it'll be great, it's really fun, let's get going. I like convinced her this is gonna be great. And of course when I get on, you know, I push the throttle like all the way to the floor, which is like, you know, a scorching 14 miles an hour or whatever it is. And uh, you know, and I'm like just going in circles and whatever, just like trying to encourage her. And she's kind of a bit far behind me. And uh, as, we, as I go to cross this road, there's a, a gentleman who's walking a bit clumsily, uh, taking up a lot of room on this, on this pathway that you're allowed to go on. It was sort of like this extended sidewalk bikeway. And I was like, just, you know, I'm being cavalier because I'm an expert. I do this all the time. Wife, look at me. Let me lead the way. And as I come up behind this guy, I realize I kind of need to go a little bit on the grass to sort of get around him. But as I go to move to the side, I realize that there is like a massive like gash in the in the in this bike path, like a saw like bigger than the width of the tire of the scooter. And it, it goes for an extended like probably like three, four feet. And I just I could not think fast enough as I moved over, realizing I'm going to hit this gash, which is going to get the tire stuck, which is going to definitely cause an accident. I need to kind of move a little further over. As I move a little further over, there's some sort of crosswalk sign, a little metal pole. And for whatever reason, I wasn't even moving that fast, I only had one move, which was to simply wrap myself around, <laughs> around this, this sign. So I, I quite literally turned and then bam, like slammed, <laughs> slammed into the sign. Corey described it almost as I went horizontal and then just my body wrapped around the side. <laughs> now those of you who know Corey knows you know that she is kind and gentle and she I don't even realize this is, is holding in what is like a full breath laughter. Like she is just she is beside herself. Multiple cars slowing down. Are you all right man? Are you all right man? Everybody was actually really polite. I was waiting for someone to honk their horn and and yell something just ridiculous at me because I definitely deserved it in this moment. I mean, it was like everybody who's walking by, driving by, my own wife is like, what 
happened here. Now, like a little later that day, where we're actually now walking and have graduated from, sco- from, from scooter ride, we come upon, I'll show you this picture here on the screen. We come, up, we come upon this moment, um, this, 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 uh, this really big sign, as you can see here. And someone, we're presumably in the middle of the night, had dug up this big plant that's right below this sign and placed it inside one of the letters of this sign. And I walk by, and again, our first reaction is, what on earth happened here? Like, and I start cracking up. I'm like, this is sort of genius. Obviously, it's incredibly disrespectful to the sign, to the plant, to the garden, to the whole thing. To which Corey then goes, like, goes and grabs the plant and, and as you can see here in this picture, replants the plant here on the side of this like major intersection in downtown Nashville, leaving a bit of dirt up on the side, and clearly this had been replanted, leaving other people to come by to ask the question, I'm quite sure, what happened here? It's a great line, right? Because it can go either way. It's the cry of the person who's wrecked and destroyed, or the situation that's wrecked and destroyed and uncertain. And the line, what happened here, is the cry of joy. It's the cry of the wonder-filled. It's it's the cry of the ecstatic and the surprised. It's a lot, right? It's a lot like church. It's a lot like church. It keeps being both. Because Jesus, right, didn't come for the healthy. He says, I came for the sick. We are people who have died and continue to die to our sins so that we would be reborn in abundant life. The kingdom of God that Jesus invites us into, like that's why the defining mark, by the way, of Easter people is this baptism. This baptism. It's that death that, was so, that we all need to die to ourselves, to the brokenness and hypocrisy and backwardness and idolatry and evil that exists in our own hearts. All the ways that we as a community are jacked up that others could look and go, I thought you were a Christian. What happened here? And all the ways that we see these transformative, beautiful, powerful stories. We see this embodied as Easter people in baptism, which by the way, if you're new again to the Christian story, baptism is simply a watery grave. It is the dying to yourself and then being reborn. It is sort of the Pledge of Allegiance. It's this is now my native land. It is a a ceremony and a symbol and has this sort of sacramental, there's something mysterious and thin about it, which is why Jesus commands his disciples to do this. We first submit to baptism, and then we, as all those that are here that are watching online who've been baptized, we also remember it over and over again. This is where we were named. This is why whenever we have a baptism service, you'll always hear me say the line, some of us today who aren't being baptized need to get a little bit of baptism on us. We need a little little bit of water on us. We need to remember what has happened and what continues to happen. Now, I want you to see something. So sorry for this squeaky stand today. I want you to see something, especially uh, those of you who are familiar with the Bible. I I want to have you zero in on something. Jesus' baptism at the Jordan, was marked by this descent of the Holy Spirit. Like this was a powerful moment where the Holy Spirit descends. And in that moment, we get the announcement. We read in Mark 1.11, this is my beloved son, my son in whom I'm well pleased. This begins Jesus' public work and proclaiming the kingdom of God. Then in Matthew's account, As the resurrected Jesus gives his final instructions to his disciples, who, by the way, pass those instructions on and on and on, generation to generation, to all the way to us, passes these instructions to his disciples for the continuation of his work to all the people all over the world. He commands them to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the baptism of the first community of followers of Jesus in Jerusalem was marked in an incredibly similar way by the descent of the Holy Spirit coming among them in the book of Acts. And at that time, they began to speak the language and do the work of God's kingdom. And then Paul writing to the New Testament churches, puts the resurrection stories into the language of personal participation in 
baptism. We die with Christ. We go under the water and then we rise with Christ, right? The same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive in us. In the same way, Jesus' birth and death come together and become resurrection. Our birth and our death come together and become resurrection. Eugene Peterson writes, baptism marks and defines us in a life of formation by resurrection. Capture that line for a moment, of formation by resurrection. Baptism puts the resurrection on display as a singular event, something that happened, but also that happens. Resurrection announces again and again and again what happened here. It keeps bringing us down into death and raising us to new life again. This is one of the reasons I'm a follower of Jesus. Even in moments of doubt and struggle, I can't help but look around at all of you. I wish I could see all of you today watching online. I've got way too many stories of radically transformed lives in my pocket, in my diary, in my journal, on my social media feeds. I mean, for days and days and days over the last few decades of my life. It's just baptism, remembering the baptism over and over. It's the thing that causes me not just to keep going in my faith, but as I look to others and go, oh my gosh, what happened here? Oh my gosh, what happened here? I see that first Peter passage just leap off the page, living stones. This, is, this isn't about Hayes Street. This isn't about, about, about <laughs> schools on the north and east side. This is about a family that God's building and putting together living stones. Living stones, living monuments to the supernatural. Living monuments to his covenant. And so we order our life. We order our life in view of the resurrection, in view of our baptism. In light of being Easter people, we remember that God has saved us and rescued us and redeemed us and wants to keep doing that and keep transforming us to help us become more and more day by day who he says we already are, to live like we are loved, to live like we have no fear of death, to live in line with how reality is at its most true, to pledge allegiance, to claim our birthright, to accept that you've been adopted into a better and truer family. You get it. The question What happened here? The question asked of the living stone is the natural response to a transformed and transforming life. C.S. Lewis puts it like this. He says, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor here, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. Come on. (laughs) He's building a palace and we settle for a cottage. Right before Peter, going back to that passage, talks about being a living stone, he writes this, Rid yourselves of malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of any kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. That you have tasted, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. You may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. What's Peter saying? 
What's Peter saying? Like our participation with God is critical. We have to grow up into our salvation, leaning into our new identity. We must allow this work to happen in us, to join him in this. We have to learn again and again a new way of being. I love giving talks like this because it's the thing I find myself needing again and again is that reminder as I head into a new day, as I head into a new week, that I am not just joining God in the renewal of all things out there, but right here. I have to allow God to do that work within me. Just like someone who's moved to a new country. I have to learn new customs and new social norms and a new language. We have to keep learning and practicing and understanding the culture of this new world. Thomas Merton writes, If you want to identify me, ask me not where I live or what I like to eat or how I comb my hair, but ask me what I'm living for in detail And ask me what I think is keeping me from living fully the thing I want to live for. Between those two answers, you can determine the identity of any person. The better the answer they have, the more of a person they are. Getting a little snarky there. Ask me what I'm living for in detail. And ask me what I think is keeping me from living fully the life that I am called to live. How you live is what you really believe and everything else is talk, at least according to the way of Jesus, right? We believe that Jesus offered not just hard sayings or high ideals, but concrete ways then to practice God's will and be delivered from the bondage of sin. In the book Kingdom Ethics, it writes, He taught his followers how to participate in God's reign. He taught, this is Jesus, taught what the kingdom is like, what its characteristics are, and therefore what kinds of practices are done by those who participate in it and are ready for it. Obeying Jesus through tangible practices is central, right, to what it means to be a follower of Jesus and it's central to our church. This is why we do rule of life. If you've never heard of that, rule of life. Like we try to design habit guides and plans. We take stock of the thousands of years of Christianity, of different ways that people have learned to practice the way of Jesus. Practices are vital and imperative to being transformed, to remembering our baptism. And that in and of itself is a practice. And thus triggering the question, what happened here? What happened here? Practicing of God is unleashing the work that God has done and is doing. A few reminders. Practicing the way of Jesus. Like having a plan for what it looks like as you step into a new week. Not just to not sin, but to begin to become an apprentice of Jesus. It unleashes God's presence. We read in Philippians 4.9, Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Practices unleash God's presence in your life. Practices bring intimacy. We read in John 14, verse 21, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Our home with them. There's an intimacy when we begin to step in line with reality, with how things truly are. When we practice the way of Jesus, when we begin to put disciplines and habits, this is what I mean by practice into our life, it unlocks blessing. James 1, 25 says, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. There's some sort of blessing and joy and freedom that gets unlocked when we step onto the Jesus path. Practices reveal more of God through others. We read in 1 John 4, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Practices reveal more 
of God through other people. Lastly, practices make the love of Jesus. And we could go down this list for a while, I guess. But practices make the love of Jesus tangible. 1 John 3, this is how we know what love is. Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother and sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. The early church, the first Easter people devoted themselves to practicing the way of Jesus together in community. A house built by living stones. A house built by a bunch of what happened here's. <laughs> Pursuing the way of Jesus. Pursuing practices opens up our heart to the God who's been there all along. It makes us aware of the grace and love that is present because you don't have to earn anything. You're freed up to strive without fear of lost identity. Now, one last time, let's return to 1 Peter. After he invites them, he says, you are to be living stones, a holy priesthood. This is who you are. This is what the church is. He says, for in scripture it says, see I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. This is the prophet referring to Jesus, Peter quoting him. Now, to you who believe, he goes on, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, and then he goes back and quotes ancient scripture, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. The, they stumble, Peter says, because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you, but you, you're chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Easter people. Easter people look to the cross and to the resurrection and they simply ask what happened here. This is what Peter's saying. Keep your eyes fixed on the living stone, on the cornerstone. This is how we become people. who ask each other the question day in and day out, not just once, and not just the epic heroic stories, but the non-heroic moments of transformation that God's inviting us into. What happened here? What happened here? In some ways, th this, this message is just an invitation as the flowers are blooming, as the tide is changing with the pandemic as re-entry is happening across the board, as you can sense a, a, a lighter spirit in the air, at least for many of us. It's just an invitation to keep going. This is who you are. This is who God has said you are. You are adopted into this family. Now begin to take on the practices and culture and language and life of this family. What? is God inviting you to look at? What practices has he been inviting you to pick up and to step into in this new season? The church is a community of what happened here. And so we need you. We need you. We need you to evaluate if you've buried any treasure somewhere that you need to dig back up. We need you to become healthy and whole in Jesus. We need you to become who God created you to be. I need you to submit your life all over again to Jesus in this next season. If we're going to carry so many who are struggling with mental health and those who are drenched in fear right now, if we are going to carry the cause of Christ forward, if we are going to be people who allow God to build his kingdom here among us, we need you. We need you. We need you. Easter people look to the communion table 
and they ask, what happened here? Every good and every perfect thing that God wants to do in you and that God wants to do through you begins here. It begins at that place, at the cross, at the resurrection, and all that this table represents. And so, let me turn to my friends who are watching online. We want to continue um, to have a, a special online specific place, not just kind of watching us take communion, but a place where you can go um, and take communion. And so uh, right now there's a link that's coming right up on the screen, sanctuaryri.org backslash Zoom, and click that and head over to Zoom just for five, six more minutes. And um, one of our leaders and pastors will lead you all in communion in a moment of reflection. And then there'll be some people who are available uh, to pray for you. You can jump into a breakout room or just list some prayer requests there in the chat. But church is not over. Come and join them uh, in, in taking communion. For the rest of us, uh, let's come to the table together and continue to worship.